I want to thank you for purchasing this tape. And as a result of your purchase, I'll be able to preach this gospel around the world. Thank you for being a partner with me. God bless you. And I know you're going to be blessed at what you view today on this tape. I have three outstanding testimonies of God's miracle working power to let you know that Jesus Christ is not dead, but he is alive. Now, we believe in prayer. I want you to call the number on your screen. If you have an emergency prayer request, 24 hours a day, somebody's there to pray with you. Or if you can't uh, dial the number, then I want you to write me a letter because we'll pray until you get an answer. And my message today is about the rapture of the church. It's going to prepare you for the greatest event that the world has ever known. So sit back and relax in your home and enjoy the testimonies of God's power. Come here, Esther, will you? This is Esther Bake from down in Punta Gorda, Florida. Welcome to Memphis, Tennessee. Esther. And Esther has come back. Esther, I'll never forget when you came. You couldn't even turn your neck. That brace had you so in that contraption that you had to turn your body like this. Is that right? What happened? It was an accident, wasn't it? Well, it was during the year 1960. I was involved in two automobile accidents. The first one, I had my skull fractured, my collarbone was broken, and my left leg was uh, messed up. I had a blood clot on my leg the size of a grapefruit. When the doctor opened it, he stuck a knife on it, and the flesh just tore. And you could see from the inside out all the ligaments and everything. And so it had to heal from the inside out. I was still under the doctor's care when I was in an automobile accident in uh, September of 1960. And my neck was broken in two places. My spine was chipped all the way down. And when they took me to the hospital, I was uh, sitting in the car. with my I was holding my head uh, in my hands and in my elbows was resting on my knees. And the, the policeman just picked me up and set me in the cruiser took me to the hospital. When I got to the hospital, I couldn't walk because uh, at that time they found I was paralyzed from my waist down. So they uh, took x-rays. They took seven sets of x-rays that night. And uh, they had me in traction. I laid flat on my back for several weeks with sandbags on either side of my head. And well, you said this was in 1960. 1960, yes. And I was put in a full-length torsal cast. I think Brother Shambach has a picture of um, me in this uh, cast. I was it was back in 73, I think it was, you put it in your magazine. The only thing that showed was my face and the top of my head because the cast was covered all the way down to my hips and my arms were sticking out. And I was like that for two months. And uh, I remember the next day, it was two days afterwards, it took about two days for the cast to dry. They finally brought, come in and set me up on the side of the bed. I couldn't stand to sit up because after being laying flat on my back for so long, so uh, the next day, they just laid me back down the bed. The next day, they were able to set me up. And then the third day, why, they stood me up on my feet. Even though I was, um, the paralysis had started coming back, or uh, my feeling had started coming back from the paralysis, I was still partially paralyzed on my right side. Even though I was in that shape, I could still stand up. And uh, so uh, it took about a week before I could uh, uh, move, and they helped me to walk around the uh, end of the bed and so forth to get my mobility back. And uh, so then after they took me out of the cast, they put me in this neck brace, which I wore really for 11 years. The first year, I... Uh, the you wore it for 11 years? It was 11 From years. 60 to 71? Right. And uh, the first... Uh, the reason I think a little bit was confused there, the first year the insurance company paid for all the medicines that I was taking. I was spending $100 a month just on medicine. So for 10 years, which would have made a total of 11 years, 10 years I put $100 a month out just for pain pills alone. And uh, on July of 1971, I heard Brother Shambach on the radio. Now listen to this. The medical profession did everything they could. The Mayo Clinic, I believe it was, that, that diagnosed her. And she heard a radio broadcast. There's something about the Word of God that gives you hope. She didn't know who Brother Shambach was. Most folks, when they hear me on radio, they think Brother Shambach's a black man. Just like everybody does. 
and they get shocked when they see me. But it's not the color, it's the message. Now this, this is one reason, and I don't mind telling you, this is one reason why I like radio over television. Television, they may not like your color, and they'll flip the channel. They may not like your tie, but on radio, they judge you on one thing, and that's what you say. And what you say carries weight with it if it's, if it's under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And it gave this girl hope. What year was this that you came to the tent, Esther? It was in 1971. I might back up just a little bit. During that 10, 11 years, I was in and out of numerous hospitals. Every time we heard of a doctor that might be of help to me, we went. And my mom and dad, they did everything in their power because they wanted to see me well. They didn't like to see me in the condition that I was in. So they exhausted every avenue. Right. We sure did. And our financial bank or the money they had in the bank, too, they, they went through that just to help me out. But you could never get well. I couldn't get well. They, the doctors that I had gone to, the orthopedic doctors that I had gone to said that I could have surgery, but I, there would only be a 50-50 chance of me being paralyzed from my neck all the way down. Well, what caused you to come to an old tent? I mean, this is not a, a building, this is not a civic center auditorium, but it's an old big gospel tent that was big as a football field. And whatever possessed you to come there? Well, I heard you on the radio, and I thought if I could just get to the tent, I knew God was going to heal me. Now, wait a minute. Stop right there. You hear what she said? She said, I knew that if I could just get there, that God would heal me. That was her faith. She knew that if I could just get there, God would heal me. And, what, and this was on a Thanksgiving, I remember it. What year was it? 1971, the day after Thanksgiving. And here she comes to the meeting, and I saw her in this brace. The day service, they gave you a prayer card. Right. And then that prayer card, there were so many people to pray for that we couldn't pray for everybody, so we had some semblance of order that we gave the prayer card out. And I asked her, I'll never forget what I asked you, Esther. I said, what did you come here for? You said, I come to get healed. <laughs> oh, I said, you, you, you answered it right. I come to get healed. And I'll never forget with that. It was a steel brace. A steel uh it was more, it had a, co a plastic collar around it. In fact, I had calluses all the way around from here, all the way around, and also I had a sunk in place here where the, uh, the weight of that, where I wore it for so long. And it was, uh, there was metal pieces on each side here of the brace. Well, when I prayed, what did I do? Well, you, <laughs> you, you took my head and gave it a jerk, and uh, I tell you. <laughs> I'll never forget it, folks. I did this. I had, I cradled her her face in my hand. And I said, well, now you said you were coming to get healed. <laughs> now we either heal them or kill them. <laughs> One or the other. And I'll never forget, I took her neck and went, bam! And put it back, mm -hmm. and God totally healed Esther. <laughs> and she went back, and they couldn't even find a break in the neck. That one leg was shorter than the other. Three quarters of an inch shorter. And what happened to that? Well, it grew out. It did. <laughs> I'm talking about a God. Ah, now, wait a minute. There's a little P.S. to this also. Esther was spending $100 a month on pain pills. And her heart was, and you don't mind me saying this, you don't like to tell this, but she said, Brother Shambach, since I've been paying $100 a month on pain pills, I'd like to give that to God now. I'd like to give God that $100 a month. Now, you know, this, ain't, this, this, is, this is not like a preacher talking. I said, oh, no. No, no, girl. You're not giving that $100. Because there's some things that you have been deprived of. By spending that $100 a month, I said, you go out and spend that $100 and get some pretty dresses and some other things. But I want to give it to God. Isn't it just like a woman? I said, well, let's pray a different way. I said, 
you got a job? I work for the city. I said, let's pray. And I said, are you the boss? No, I'm one of the workers. Let's pray and ask God to make you the boss. <laughs> that means they'll raise your pay. So we put the tent up from there in South Bay, Florida, a little old town of South Bay. And here you come in in that little Dotson. I'll never forget it. And she grabbed a hold of me and she said, Brother Sam, I got it. I'm now running the office. And they gave me $300 a month raise. You can't be God given. No matter how much you try. Esther, since 1971, God healed you. And here it is, 94. I hate to date it. But here it is, 1900, 94. See, now I can cut that out if I want to. What did the skeptics say when they say, how long does it last? Here it's been 23 years, and you're still well. I'm still healed today. Praise God. She's given God praise. Thanks, thanks for coming here to Memphis. Give the Lord a big hand clap, everybody. He'll do it for you. I said he'll do it for you. Ain't nobody do you like Jesus. This is Glenn Leonard. Give him a hand of welcome as he comes. We were in a meeting out in Los Angeles at the shrine. And I just got a small portion of the story. But I'm so glad that you came to Memphis to share your testimony with the world, Glenn. You're tuned into the world now. You once were out in that world, but something happened to you. And I want you to tell us your story, brother. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, I... I grew up in the inner city of Washington, D.C., and um, when I discovered the gift to sing, I, uh, I went forward to pursue my gift and cultivate it and develop it, and I did, and I, and I saw it as the answer to my situation, you know. Yeah. How many, anybody in here from the inner city? You, you know what inner city life is like. <laughs> yeah, but well, you know, we needed food on the table, we needed shoes on our feet, clothes on our back, those kind of things. We were experiencing needs, and I saw this as the answer and so I pursued it and when I found out that folk would pay me I said, you know I'm no Einstein but mama didn't know fool either I said that'll work praise the, that'll work I didn't say praise the Lord but I say praise the Lord now <laughs> but uh, people people began to pay me uh, as, a, as a young young guy uh, I was like 13 years old and people used to pay me to come sing at their parties and their little social gatherings in the neighborhood and then it kind of uh, escalated uh, locally and then um, regionally and nationally. And um, through, through singing and cultivating, I cultivated three groups, put three groups together. And um, I, I saw this group on television, the one, the Ed Sullivan Show. Five tall guys, they were lean, they were good looking guys, they could sing pretty good. And, and, um, they were, they were the best out there, and when I saw them, I was immediately impacted by what I saw. There's a power in music that touches you, that touches the triune person. And uh, one day we're going to learn some things about that, praise the Lord. But I saw this group, and, and, and they, I was immediately impacted by them. And I, and I said something, just looking at them, that one time I said, I'm going to be just like them. And from that point, I started to listen to them. I started to to uh, follow them by all their records. I started to dress like them, sing like them. Now there's a principle in the Bible that declares that if we behold the image of Christ, we are changed into his image. I call it the principle of transformation. You will be changed into whatever image you behold. I didn't know that at that time. You see the evidence of that today when you watch Michael Jackson, there are Michael Jackson impersonators. Elvis Presley is probably the one, uh, one of the most people impersonated. Hey, you in Elvis town now, brother. <laughs> is that, oh? <laughs> but you're, it's, this is a good point, and it's yeah, so yeah. true. It's a, it's a powerful truth, and I, I didn't understand it then, but uh, the, the principles of God work either for you or against you. They work whether you save or not. 
Not knowing this, um, I, I began to behold the image of the temptations. And brothers and sisters, let me tell you, the Bible says that when you obey God, the blessings of God will chase you down and overtake you. So will sin. I wasn't looking for the temptations. My group had split up. The third group that I had put together split up. We were in Toronto, Canada, and I was woodshedding. I was putting together a new act. And they had put out feelers all around the country looking for me. See, something happens when you behold things in your life. It, 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 it launches you into a pattern of destiny. And you wonder how things have come on you or how things happen to you. You got, in, you got in the image. You got in the way of something. And you start to take it into your life. So here, here I am. I'm in Toronto, Canada. And um, they're looking for me. Uh, a friend of mine called me and told me the temptations were, were, wanted to know if I wanted to join the group. And I said, uh, most definitely. So they sent, sent for me to come to California. I went to California. And um, I, I had come to the conclusion that, well, this is it. I've made it now. Everything's going to be all right. I can pay my bills. I can eat regular, change clothes, and, you know, and all those kind of things. Drive a nice car, uh, live in a nice house, and, and, and elevate myself out of the, the, uh, the, the things that so many people are faced with today, devastation and poverty. Right around the fifth year of my career, I noticed a serious void. I, I was still chasing something. Now, I, now mind you, I'm, I'm with one of the premier groups of the whole entire world. The Temptations were a cornerstone in music history. Let me interrupt one minute, because there's somebody watching right now. I sense it in my spirit that you're struggling with the same thing that Glenn struggled with. But you're still searching for something. And you wondered why you flipped that TV set on. Listen, he has your answer. Go ahead, Glenn. I'm, I'm, I'm experiencing this adrenaline rush, I guess I can describe it as that, after the performance. You know, entertainers, athletes, professional people, they, they experience an adrenaline rush when they do their thing that maybe most people don't. And so I found myself after the concerts, after the, uh, the recording sessions and all that kind of stuff, still looking for that thrill, that excitement, and that whirlwind, but it, it wasn't there. So I turned to uh, drugs, I turned to the jet set type lifestyle, chasing this sensation. I didn't understand at that time that there's a void. There's a little space in everybody's heart that's designed just for God. And nothing you try to force into that thing will fit. Amen. Amen. I, I tried to force drugs in it. I tried to force uh, 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 women, um, uh, the jet set lifestyle, partying, all those things. And it overtook me. I became consumed with those things. And so, you know, I did like a, a lot of people do. When, when things are going bad in your career or on your job, you figure you need a new job. Folks, are, things are going bad at home. Some folks figure they need a new husband or a new wife. <laughs> so you take the same old problem into a new situation. And I was about to do the same thing. I left the Temptations to pursue a solo career. And I had just finished uh, putting my little recording package together. And uh, we were having a little celebration party. And I had friends and associates flying in from all over the country. They were congratulating me on this pursuit of this solo career. Everybody was telling me, you're going to do great, man. You're going to make it. You're going to do good. Well, the party lasted about three days and three nights. And uh, we, we did all the things that sinners do. Yeah, we did. We did all the things that sinners do. We, we got high. We parted night and day. Three days and three nights I was gone. Um, at the end of those three days and three nights, everybody's gone. I'm standing in the hotel suite by myself. And um, I'm thinking, I'm just going over this, everything now. I'm getting ready to partake a new endeavor, and I'm excited about it. And I'm just I'm, I'm thinking about where I'm going, what I'm going to do. And a thought came to my mind. The thought was, what's going to make this time any different than the last time? And I tell you, fear came over me because I knew what my life was like. A lot of other people didn't. And I, I can recall the times when young kids would, would, would walk up to me and run up to me and, Mr. Leonard, can I, can I have your autograph? I want to be just like you. And they didn't have any idea what my life is like. And so here I am now, and this thought is going through my mind. What's going to make this time any different than the last time. And uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't like the thought. I didn't like what I was hearing in my mind. So I, 
I turned on the television to kind of kill the silence in the room. And as I was flipping the channel, it was, it was in the wee hours of the morning, maybe 2.30, I don't know. It, it was late. There was nothing much on. So I, I, I was flipping the channel. I heard a man's voice, and I flipped it back. And just about the time I flipped it back, <laughs> Ooh, glory. This is good. You heard what he said? We hours in the morning. We rerun them all the time. I'm home sleeping while he's listening to this. This is beautiful. As, as I flipped it back, a man shouted at me across the television. He said, you! Yeah! Sitting in the hotel room! Now, now, that kind of hit me a little, little strange because they called me boy. Yeah, I bet it did. <laughs> but it got my attention. And then he did this little dance. He did, did this little... That, that's it, that's it. That's it. <laughs> I, I, had, I didn't know who R.W. Schambach was. I had never seen him before in my life. He said, Jesus is what you're looking for. And he pointed his finger in the camera. And it was almost like 3D. The finger looked like it was coming straight through the lens. And, uh, and uh, it, it kind of startled me because he was addressing my... See, you know when God's talking to you. Yes, sir. Because it goes past your ear and it hits your heart. And it jars your very being. He said, Jesus is what you're looking for. And I, I begin to tremble. I'm standing there. And, uh, and all of a sudden, I'm coherent. I'm sober. After three days and three nights of cocaine, weed, marijuana, champagne, after three days and three nights, and I'm standing there, I mean, I mean, constant consuming, constantly consuming, and I'm sober now, and this man has my attention across the television. Well, now, for a moment, I thought maybe that the drugs, you know, I was tripping or something. I didn't know. That's trip you've been on, man. Oh, yes, hallelujah. I, 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 didn't know, I didn't know what was happening to me. But when he said the name of Jesus, I got weak in my knees and the bed was right behind me. Then I kind of collapsed on the bed and I started to weep. Now, you know, I, 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 I grew up in the inner city and, you know, real men don't cry. <laughs> but here I am. I'm standing there and I'm, and I'm weeping. And uh, he says, get up. Go call your wife. And by this time, I, I, I immediately moved to the telephone. Went to the telephone and called my wife. My wife hadn't seen me in three days and three nights. He said, she's worried about you. Go home to your family. So I called my wife and I told her I was going home. And uh, she could hear that I was crying. And she, she, she thought something had really, really happened real bad because I never cry. Never, never cry. Real men don't cry. Y'all know how y'all used to be. And uh, so here I am now. I'm crying and she could hear it. And so she says, what's wrong with you? I said, I don't know, but I'm coming home and I'm going to find out. Well, that night I went home. And I, I couldn't sleep. I walked, well, let me just tell you this. I'm, I'm in this hotel room, and when he got through talking to me, I felt like somebody was in the room. And at first, I said it was an it, but later on, I found out it was the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. See, see I, had, I had a supernatural encounter with Almighty God by the power of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost came in the room, and it was so real to me. Then I began to look around over my shoulder to see who was there. I looked in the closet. I looked under the bed. But there was nobody visibly there that I could see. But I could feel his presence. I could sense his presence. He was there. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You can tell something happened to this man. I stayed there. I was, I was almost afraid to go out of the room because I, I, I didn't understand what was happening to him. This was, this, now, you got to understand, I didn't grow up in church. Didn't hear nothing about Jesus. Didn't know nothing about being born again. Never read the Bible. My mother used to recite the 23rd song to us when we were little. But I didn't grow up in church. I didn't, have, I didn't come from a Christian atmosphere and environment. This was the very first time that I had any evidence that God was real. The presence of the Holy Spirit came in that room. And I sensed in my heart, I got to get out of here now. So I left. Got in my car, shaking and trembling. Drove home, walked the floor all night long. And I'm trying to figure out what happened to me. And I wasn't going to tell anybody. 
I, I, cause I was gonna sound crazy. I said, I'm not gonna tell nobody about that. They're gonna, they're gonna really think that I done, I done got to hold to some bad cocaine, some bad dope, and he all messed up now. So I wasn't gonna tell anybody then, and, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm up all night, and I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what, what do I do? What, what, what was this that happened to me? And a young lady who had been traveling with the Temptations, we were doing a Temptations reunion, and uh, she was our opening act. She was a comedian. Wonderful young sister. She had gotten saved during the tour. And we, her and I used to always talk backstage, and we used to always say to each other, there's got to be more than this. There's got to be something else that we, we're not getting. We're not getting out of this thing that we're doing. This entertainment thing is not giving us that fulfillment, that substance that we were looking for. And she had gotten saved and was trying to tell me about her experience. She was always trying to corner me. Glenn, I found the answer. I found the answer, and I would never listen to her. And, her, and she came to my mind. And I heard a little voice say, go see Alice. And God sovereignly moved this lady up on the third floor in the apartment building where I was staying. My Lord. She had only been there a few weeks. And, uh, and so I go up and I knock on her door. And I told her, I told her what had happened to me in the hotel room. And she, she, she just started shouting and she started jumping and laughing. And she said, come on, come on in. She opened the Bible and, uh, and prayed with me, led me to the Lord. That was March the 8th. 1984, 5 p.m. I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. 15 minutes later, 5.15, got filled with the Holy Ghost. You better watch out, man. Got filled with the Holy Ghost. 15 minutes later. You mean you didn't have to wait 40 days? Spoke in tongues immediately. Now, now, I can't tell you why. I, all, all I know is she said, see, I, I know this. I was in a place where I, I had no more alternatives. I had no more answers. So I don't, maybe my heart was just in a place where I was just totally open. But she said, you need the Holy Ghost. I said, well, I want it. And I asked and got filled and spoke. 1984. What are you doing now, Glenn? Well, we are, we are, we're preaching the gospel. We, I know it. <laughs> some, some, uh, some of my entertainment friends, you know, they, they came to me and they said, well, brother, you know, that's okay to go to church, but you don't have to do all that. You know, and they, they want to know why, why, why I want to go to this extreme. And, I, and I, all I can tell them is there's no place else to go after a supernatural encounter with God. That's right. There's absolutely no place else to go. So my, my wife is a, is a young lady who uh, some of you may remember. Uh, she was the lead dancer on a, and choreographer on a show called Solid Gold. And uh, she watched me for a few months, and she wanted to make sure this thing was real. She saw me struggle in some areas, but she saw me persevere. She saw me continue on. And that bore witness to her that something happened to this man because he's not letting this thing go. And she saw it happen in your life. Right. And then she came. I led her to the Lord, led my, my children. And uh, we, just, we were just radical. We went to... <laughs> We went to her family, my family. They, they ran from us for a while. Every time they saw us coming, we had them Bibles, so they didn't want to. <laughs> but one of the things we do, um, the entertainment realm is one of the last pioneers, uh, 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 pioneer works in the earth. It's, it's one of the last frontiers, and we've had the opportunity to, to minister, to preach the gospel in uh, a lot of the entertainment fellowship lunches and gatherings they have. And uh, we've seen corporate people, producers, backers, uh, uh, agents, come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I've ministered to some of my, 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 um, my associates in the world, other celebrities, other entertainers. And I, I, believe, I just believe with all my heart that God does not give you the capacity, the ability to impact people's lives just for the reason of making you rich or famous. Right. Amen. So I'm, I'm real radical with this. I'm sold out. My life is lived out to preach the gospel. Bless your heart, brother. I want to thank you for coming to Memphis, Tennessee and sharing this with the world, brother. Any of you preachers that are listening like to have him come to your church, I'd be a blessing to you, I tell you. Thanks, buddy. I love you so much. Give the Lord a big hand clap, everybody. Hold on to your seatbelt, fasten it tight.
We have one more testimony. Brother Derlin, if you will, please come. <clears throat> Derlin Wilson comes from a little town over in Alabama. What's the name of that town, brother? Albertville. 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 I don't even know where it's at. Don't feel bad. A lot of other people don't either. This man, I just met him today for the first time, but I read what happened to him in a newspaper that hit the front pages. The AP picked it up and carried it, and a little lady underlined it, and sent it to me, and she said, Brother Schambach, I thought you'd be interested in what this says about this young preacher. He wasn't always a preacher. Right. <laughs> he was a drug addict. Yes. Alcoholic. alcoholic been in prison. Yeah. All messed up. And it's all because he came from a church Amen. that preached that once you get saved, if you ever backslide, they ain't no way back. Amen. Now, you may be one of them. Amen, and it's a lie from the pit of hell. Amen. There is a way back. Amen. When he found out there was no way back, he just figured, well, I might as well go serve the devil and do a good job of it. That's exactly right. And that's what he did. How Amen. long ago was it, brother? Well, actually, uh, I was raised in the church, Brother Schumbach, and, and all my life I was taught that if, if in this world only I had hope, I'd be of all men most miserable. And that uh, it came out of the book of Hebrews where it said if you once tasted of the heavenly gift and turned back, then there's no chance. And so being taught this all my life, I actually backslid in 1976. Uh, but I wouldn't tell anybody. Really, really, and I was saved and filled with the Holy Ghost in 1970. And, and, uh, and, and two weeks after I was baptized in the Holy Ghost, I found myself sitting in the lap of sin. And so for six years until 1976, I would try to go to church and I would sit as far back as I could to keep hoping that nobody wouldn't know that I was in sin. And you were under condemnation all that time. That's right. I was, I was under condemnation. I was under conviction to repent, but I didn't think I could repent. There was no, no repentance. That's right. There was no repentance. In 1976, it got worse. And, of course, by this time, the only reason that I didn't just throw my hands up and quit them is because I didn't want my mom and dad and, and my people to know it. And but you were called to preach. But something happened, and, and here you are now living in sin, mm -hmm. and you were in prison. And your wife is with you tonight. Yes. And here you are sitting at home watching a television set. Okay, after, after I come out of jail and, and uh, got out, uh, my wife and I, we, this, is, this could be a long story. <laughs> We're trying to break it down a little bit. But my wife and I, we, we moved to Arab, Alabama. And we were sitting there in the living room, and I had become very abusive of her. I mean, I would, I would abuse her with language and, and just very mean to her. And she would actually pray, and she wasn't saved at the time, but she would pray that I would get killed on the way home so that she wouldn't, she wouldn't have to face me. That's how bad it had gotten. Don't turn that television set off now because there's a lot of you in the same boat this man was in. But he found a way out. I was sitting there, and, and, and as this brother said earlier, I was flipping the dial trying to find something. Now, you've got to understand that all these years I had been tormented. I was in torment. I would lay down at night and feel the flames of hell coming up on my legs. And I would say, Lord, if I just had a chance, I'd serve you. If I just had an opportunity, and I'd hear that voice in the back of my head say, no, you don't have a chance, boy. You done sewed it up. You're done for. But I was flipping the dial at night, and all of a sudden I flipped across this preacher, and he was walking across the stage like a wild man. And he said, and, and he you was preaching hellfire and brimstone. I mean, it was coming down, and I thought, boy, that's the way them old preachers used to preach. And the next thing I knew, I reached up, and I got tired of listening to it real quick. I, I was sitting there, and, and uh, uh, I was drinking, and my mother-in-law was there, and she was drinking. My wife was drinking wine, and, and, and so I reached up to flip the dial, and that finger right there, it's not near as big in person as it is when it comes out that TV set. 
Hallelujah. It came out to set and pointed at me right in the face and said, don't touch that dial. And I sat down and I said, who does this guy who, well, I said some other words, think he is? <laughs> and, and so I got up to turn the dial again. And that time he really got my attention. He said, I said, don't turn that dial. And I said, whoa. And the words that come out of his mouth next, he said, there's a man out there that God's called to preach. Said, you don't think you've got a chance this side of hell of going to heaven. And he said, but I want you to know that Jesus loves you and you do have a chance. And he turned and started, Brother Schambach turned and started to walk like he's fixing to go back to preaching. And he turned around and he pointed his finger back into the TV. He said, as a matter of a fact, right now, right now you're sitting in a recliner drinking an old Milwaukee beer and smoking a pipe. Church, I was sitting in a recliner, drinking an old Milwaukee beer, and smoking a pipe. Here's the picture right here that his wife took of him with an old Milwaukee beer, smoking a pipe, and sitting in a recliner. And this is how God got his attention. Amen. I, I almost tore the bedroom door off. My wife, I don't even remember getting up to run. But, I, I, I mean, she said I let out a scream. It was just scary. And I ran into the bedroom and slammed the door, and I fell on my face on the carpet. And I remember saying these words. Now, this man had just spoken to me from California, but I said, God, if you're real for me, if you're real for me, not, not nobody else, God, me, I've got to have something that will last a lifetime. I was laying flat on the carpet. And as I was laying there in tears rolling down my face, I felt two big arms reach down and pick me up. My God, uh, hallelujah. And I heard a voice whisper in this ear right here. Uh, a glory that God set me up on my knees, uh, whispered in this ear and said, I love you, son. I really, really love you. Hallelujah. And church, uh, 15 minutes later, I walked out free from drugs, uh, free from alcohol, free from wife abuse. Uh, and I'm still Because he heard a church preach that if you make a mistake and backslide, you can't come back. That lying devil. I said that lying devil. That's why we need to get on television and let the world know that no matter how far you've gone back, the Holy Ghost will find your hiding place and bring you back to the foot of the cross and restore you. Can you shout yes? You mean that quick? When you come flying out of that room, no more booze? No more booze. No more drugs. My wife don't pray for me to die before I get home anymore either. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows like a wife Amen. when the change takes place. Amen. And she possibly knew it she did. when the change took place. Amen. That was on a, a Friday night. And on Saturday night, rather than drinking like usual, we was riding around looking for a s gospel singing. And that was strange. And, and we rode to this little church, Joppa Church of God, and we pulled up in the front three times. 
And little did I know that on Sunday morning, we were going to go to church at Joppa Church of God. Now, I'd been saved and filled with the Holy Ghost that Friday night. Sunday morning, my wife at Joppa Church of God was saved and filled with the Holy Ghost too. Amen. So God's just straightening everything out. Now, now listen. I want to get into this. How come this, and, and this, this story is so beautiful from his, from his own city. Derlin Wilson is a changed man. This is what it says. Now, when the newspapers can say this, Derlin Wilson is a changed man. And you know how it starts out? It says, for many in the, ne in the area, the name Derlin Wilson strikes an unpleasant note. <laughs> you were a mess, brother. Amen. I, in my hometown, I, before I could run this revival where this started at, Brother Schambach, I had to go to some people and tell them that I owed them and I would pay them when I could because I was a crook. I mean, I was a crook. This is going on national television. You I know, know it. <laughs> they already know it, too. <laughs> <laughs> that takes a whole lot of man to stand up and say, I was a crook. Amen. Here's a part of salvation you don't hear much about today, restitution. Amen. And he's telling it now. Hey Amen. I, I remember one man in particular I went to, his name was John Hudson, and uh, he's the owner of a parts store. And I went to him and I said, Brother John, I know I ripped you off and I really, you know, I really took you and I know I did. And I said, I, I want you to forgive me. I said, I'm coming into the area to run a revival. And I said, a prophet's never received in his home country, you know. And I said, I said, I'd like to be received, and I don't want to be hung. And I said, Brother John, I'll pay you just as soon as I can. Brother John looked at me, and a tear came up in his eye and ran down his cheek. And he said, Brother Derlin, he said, you take that money you owe me, and you put it in the gospel and, and see other, other souls saved. Amen. Everybody I owed said that. Everybody I owed said that. Well, here you are preaching the gospel now. How long ago was this, Derlin? Well, this was in uh, uh, 1986 when this took place with you preaching to me on the TV. And uh, we started our ministry. And I, I sat down many times to write you a letter. And, and uh, I, I, I've never, now I say this, and you, you can give me a whipping later, but I've never sent Brother Schambach a dime. I've never wrote him a letter, never contacted him. I said, God, in your time, in your time, you'll bring this about, what's happening tonight. And people can't say that, that, that I paid Brother Schambach to get me up here. People can't say that this was a manufactured story, that, that I just wanted to make something out of the ministry because the ministry's been going since 1986. Thank God. And but now, since you've been preaching, though, how many churches do you, have you started? We've been uh, blessed to start five churches. We're on our fifth church. Uh, God has, has, has allowed us to establish a church, and, and Brother Schambach, what we do, we don't keep no strings on them. We establish them, put a pastor in them, and, and turn it over to the body and to the pastor and go on somewhere else to start another church. Amen? Hallelujah. Now, do you see why the devil's been trying to kill him? I tell you, folks, what a testimony. Thanks for sharing it with us, buddy. Appreciate you and your dear wife coming in here. Well! to this for me, will you? I want that picture. Milwaukee beer. <laughs> and everybody said amen. And amen. I'm going to read one verse of scripture. And this is the cornerstone of our faith and the gospel that we preach. And it's verse number 14. And if Christ be not risen... Then is our preaching vain, and you, and your, your faith is also vain. Let me read it again. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Our experience is based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in just a little while, all of Christendom will be celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
This is our Easter special that we are portraying tonight. And we want to let the world know that Jesus Christ is not dead, but he is alive. Can you shout amen? amen. This 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul writing to the church says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ that we preach today, and he puts it in a nutshell of what the gospel is, and I want you to hear me. This is the gospel. The first thing is that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Number one, if you're not preaching this, then you're not preaching the gospel. This is the gospel that we declare unto you. Secondly, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. These are the elements of the gospel that is preached. It's the, it recognizes, the gospel that I preach recognizes the fact of sin. And whether you like it or not, you that are tuned in watching this on television, you and I have been born in sin. If you were born of a woman, you were born in sin. And this gospel recognizes the fact of sin. And it also recognizes the divine fact of the atonement that Jesus Christ died on that cross. It wasn't the Jews that killed him. It wasn't the Roman soldier's spear that was thrust into his side that killed him. There's not a Jew living or dead could kill Jesus, but my Bible says that he was a voluntary sacrifice. He laid his life down voluntarily. They didn't kill him. Jesus said, this one thing I received from my Father, he gave me power to lay my life down, and he gave me power to take it back up again. Can you raise your hands and shout praise the Lord? Hallelujah! The divine fact of the atonement, and then the fact of the revelation of the resurrection of Christ. He is alive. I said Jesus is alive. He took my place on Calvary. When Jesus died, Shambach died with him. When Jesus was buried, Shambach was buried with him. But thank God, when Jesus came out of that grave, Shambach came out of that grave with him but it's no longer I that liveth, but it's Christ that liveth on the inside. Can you shout praise the Lord? Salvation. This gospel is preached on radio across America and around the world. It's on television, but yet America is still steeped in her sin. Nobody likes to be told that you're a sinner. But every time you hear me preach, you're going to hear me blasting it forth. This is why Jesus Christ came. He came to die for sinners. And thank God he found my hiding place. And he reached down into the depths of sin and picked me up out of the depths of sin and washed me in his blood, took out a stony heart, put in a heart of flesh, he clothed me with the righteousness of God and now I am the righteousness of Christ because of what has taken place in my life. There is a change that takes place. Every service, we just got back from Russia not long ago and we gave an altar call, a country that was shut up to the gospel for 75 years. When we went there to preach, I had no religion to fight. There was none there. The only thing I had to fight was the devil. What a refreshing predicament that was. Nobody to fight but the devil. And I'll never forget preaching. 
a simple gospel message to the Russian people. 10,000 people standing in 28 degree weather with their furs on. Standing outside under the statue of Lenin, hearing a simple gospel message. And when I gave the altar call, 10,000 people raised their hands to receive Christ. I thought they misunderstood me. I said, you don't, you're not getting what I'm trying to say. So I gave the altar call the second time. I said, if you really want Christ to come into your life and transform you, raise your right hand. They raised both hands this time. And I said, please, you're not getting it. You're not understanding it. Maybe something's being lost in the translation. So I gave the third altar call. You know, I mean, America, you got to say, please, play it again. Play the invitational song. Choir, sing it softly. Is there one that would like to get saved? Please, if you give your life to Christ, I'll take you out to dinner. Is there one? But in Russia, it's a whole new ball game. They never heard the gospel preached. But when they heard the good news of the gospel that Jesus Christ came to redeem and wash their sins away and to prepare them for heaven, they responded with the affirmative and raised their hands and God saved them and delivered them and set them free. And now they belong to the family of God. That's what the gospel does. Can you shout praise the Lord with me? This is the proof of the gospel. The evidence of the gospel that Jesus rose from the dead. Your faith and my faith hinges on this one thing, that Jesus is no longer in the tomb. You can visit the tomb of Muhammad, but when you visit the tomb of Jesus, it's empty. Our faith is based on emptiness. He's no longer here. He has risen. Oh, hallelujah. He ascended to heaven, is seated at the right hand of God the Father, and there he makes intercession for you and me. And now he says, whatever you ask the Father, in my name he will give it to you. This is why we pray, Father, in the name of Jesus. And when you pray that simple prayer, you're in the presence of God. You can lay hands on blind eyes in the name of Jesus, and they'll come open. Deaf ears will unstop, and the lame will walk and leap for joy because of that resurrection power. He is not dead, but he is alive, and he's doing today what he did 2,000 years ago. We have your answer. You that are watching by television, I tell this story everywhere we go. We went into the South Bronx. We get a lot of drug addicts and people that have been infected with the HIV virus. There is no cure for AIDS. This is the plague that has come on the world. Doctors have found no cure for AIDS. It's a virus. They never will find a cure. But hear me, I'm going on national television to tell you I found the cure for AIDS. The cure for AIDS is in the name of Jesus. The cure for AIDS is in the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus has never lost its power. Can you shout praise the Lord? Hallelujah. I'll never forget a man sitting on the front row wearing dark glasses. Got in that prayer line. I didn't know he had AIDS until he told me. He said, I'm a drug addict. I share needles with other drug addicts, and I caught the virus. Can you help me? I put my arms around him and asked God to give him a blood transfusion from Calvary. I said, Lord, infect him with that divine blood of Christ. Let it flow through his veins. Let it affect every part of his body. He sat there for 10 straight days when all of a sudden he got up and ran out. And I'm wondering, what's he running out for? I didn't know to the next night. Here he was dying, and he had a different reaction. And now, he got deathly sick, but he really wasn't sick. He got healed and didn't know he got healed. The man's been sick and got well and thought he got sick. 
Do you know you can be sick all your life and think you're well? There is no other alternative. But now that he got something from God and God allowed it to happen this way, he signed himself into the hospital. All the nurses knew him. They called his doctor. They took all of his vital signs. They took blood, they took blood from him to test it. They took the urine specimen. They did everything that nurses do. And he's in his room lying on the bed now groaning. Oh, I'm dying. Oh, I'm dying. And the doctor comes in and checks the blood. And now when the doctor checks the blood, he needs a doctor. He can't find the HIV virus. It's gone. We got the medical evidence of it. Can you shout praise the Lord? We found a cure for AIDS. It's in the name of Jesus. There's power in that name. We have your answer. If you're hooked on drugs, we have your answer. If you're sick and diseased and afflicted and the medical profession has done everything they could, but there is no hope, Thank God against hope. We have a hope, and it's in the resurrected Christ. He is not dead, but he is alive, and he'll do for you what he did for those 2,000 years ago. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We offer you Christ. I said we offer you Christ. He'll bring life to you. Do you know there is no death to the child of God? I said there is no death to the child of God. And yet you have funerals right here in this church. As a pastor, I buried a lot of folks. I have a mother that we bury. I have a father. I have a sister. But it ain't over yet. I said it ain't over yet. The church is waiting for something. I said the church is waiting for something. Thank God for blind eyes that open. Thank God people are being raised from the dead. Thank God we found power that can not only heal the sick, but it will even raise the dead. Many of you have been in a funeral service when they bring in caskets. Many of you, not many, but possibly all of you present and you that are watching by television has had somebody that you buried and you know what it is. But we're people of God. We have a hope. I said we have a hope. There is no death to the Christian. This is why we offer Christ to you. This is why we offer Christ to you. And we give you an opportunity to come to him. Many of you have visualized a scene just like is being portrayed here tonight. You see the preacher with his dark suit on, with a Bible in his hand, leading a procession, six pallbearers carrying a casket. Behind him, another preacher. This is a scene that's being portrayed in every city of America. Many of these deaths are caused by drunk drivers. Many are drive-by shootings. There's a change that has taken place in America. Caskets are brought into the church, just like you see that's brought in here today. They bring them in. And they set them down. Here comes the second one. What is the cause? When you go to a funeral, you hear that old music. Doesn't cause much shouting because loved ones are dying. Loved ones are dead. Pallbearers bringing in a casket. This is being viewed all over the world. Are you listening to me? There's the scene at the graveside. A 
I'll never forget my mother when they buried her. I'll never forget a sister of mine when she died. I stood by her casket proudly. I didn't shed any tears. And people came to me and said, why aren't you crying? I said, I ain't crying because I know where she is. To be absent from the body means to be present with the Lord. There is no death. Of course, if you're not saved, you're in a heap of trouble. I'll never forget Kenneth Hagin telling the story that he died twice in his life. Once when he was just, when he had this disease in his body, 17 years of age, he wasn't saved, and he died and went to hell. And God brought him back. Then he got saved and died the second time. And his mother, he was still crippled in his body. His mother and family were there and they were talking. And he said it was a hyphenated word that his mother, that he was saying to his mother. And the first part of the word he said here, but the second part of the word, it was hyphenated, he said in the presence of Jesus. To be absent from the body means to be present with the Lord. Hear me. This is not the end. I don't care what you have been told. I don't care what your theologian told you. When I was in the United States Navy, I buried six of my buddies in Okinawa in, at sea. I buried them at sea. But I led them all to Christ. Six suicide bombers came down and destroyed a ship with 376 men on it. Our ship picked up six of them. They were still alive, and I led them to Christ, and I had the privilege of burying them at sea. But one of these days, the sea is going to give up her dead. Can you shout amen, somebody? You're here tonight, and you're watching this television program. After death, what then? Every one of us must face God. Are you listening to me? There is a judgment that's coming on every one of us. God's not going to ask you how many cigarettes you smoked. He's not going to ask you how many Milwaukee beers you drank. He's not going to ask you how many times you committed adultery. He's going to ask you one thing. What have you done with my son, Jesus? He left the glories of heaven and came to this earth to die and suffer the ignominious death of the cross in order that you and I might live and have life more abundantly. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. This is what the Christian world is waiting for. This is the greatest event that is about to take place. Are you listening to me? This is the event that, this is the, event that the world is looking for. I have a rapture tape in my car. My wife and I were listening to it. We're not the ones that's going to be missing. It's the ones that's not going to make it in the rapture that are going to be missing. They're going to be left behind. There's only one thing that can guarantee you that you're going to be in the rapture of the church. And that is that the blood of Jesus Christ has washed your sins away. Can you shout praise the Lord with me? Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Hallelujah. Tonight's your night. Many of you have traveled hundreds of miles to be here, and you will never forget what you see here tonight. Your mind will always come back to this night, to this particular service, because many of you will reject the call of God. You will walk out of here the same way you came in. Your heart will be hardened. You will stiffen your neck, and you'll say, not tonight. Do you know this could be the night that Jesus comes? I said this could be the night that Jesus comes. Even the church world is divided. 
I've had preachers come to me and say, Brother Shambach, don't you know the word rapture's not in the Bible? I said, caught up is. Oh, hallelujah. We shall be caught up to meet him in the clouds of the sky. This is the blessed hope. Thank God we have a hope. It's not over yet, but it soon will be. Jesus is coming back for a bride that he's getting out of this earth. Hallelujah. Are you ready to go? Are you ready to meet him? Do you have your garments washed in the blood of the Lamb? I'm not talking about shaking a preacher's hand. I'm not talking about signing your name on a church door. You might as well shake a donkey's tail. Put your name on a barn door. It'll get you into heaven just as quick. But I come to tell you, you must be born again. Paul says in this 15th chapter, Behold, I show you a mystery. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. At the last trump, the trump of God shall sound. I said the trump of God shall sound. The dead in Christ shall rise first. We that are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the clouds of the sky. We shall be changed. Sing it. We shall be changed. This is an Easter service. This is a resurrection service. My Lord. resurrected saint once I was dead but now I'm alive wait a minute listen 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 what about the one in this one hold it a minute brother what about the one in this casket off a little bit brother maybe they'll get out of there blow the trumpet one more time Gabriel how come John's not getting up this brother got up this sister didn't get up this brother didn't get up you know why he didn't get up hear me They were in the temple of deliverance. One Sunday night when Brother Shambach was there preaching and he gave an altar call and they ran out instead of coming forward to accept Christ. And now when the trumpet sounds, they're not getting up. The Bible says the dead in Christ shall rise first. This is what I'm talking about. The dead in Christ. 
Christ shall rise first. And we that are alive and remain will be caught up together. This mortal will put on immortality. This corruption shall put on incorruption. Death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? I am a child of God. Hear me! If you're here tonight and you know you're not saved, Get out of your seat and come down here now. I mean move. Quick, quick, quick. Every man, every woman, every boy, every girl. Come out of that balcony and come down here. It's time to get right with God. We're going to lead you to Christ. Come down here and stand. Christ is going to do a work in your life. Come on, young man. Come on, young woman. This is your night. This visible demonstration of what God is going to do in this last day coming back for a church he's coming back for saints that have their robes washed in the blood of the lamb oh hallelujah we shall be changed sing it again while they come Every one of you that are watching by television, you can come right there where you are. When I lead them in a prayer, I want you to say the prayer where you are. Jesus Christ will save you and prepare you for this event. You can mark it down. It's going to happen. The rapture of the church. Jesus is coming back for a people that have their robes washed in the blood of the Lamb. I break the power of sin in your life. Satan, I command you in the name of Jesus, loose them and let them go free. I call resurrection power alive in your life. Be saved in Jesus' name. Keep that television set on while we lead these people to the Lord. We shall be changed. We shall be changed. moving around for two minutes unless you're moving to the front the Holy Spirit is speaking to people I sense in my spirit somebody's getting their last call from God don't play with it remain standing if you will just for a few moments all over the building thank you I appreciate that you feel God tugging at your heart please Get into that aisle. God said, if you be ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you before my Father in heaven. But he said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. I sense people that's missing God. Please get out of your seat and come. 
This was an unscheduled meeting when I called Bishop Patterson. We generally don't have a, a meeting in one city one night and the next night in another city. We generally don't. We have travel time. But I felt the urgency of it just to be here with him. And I believe the Holy Spirit had you here tonight. The devil's been trying to destroy you and kill you. And I want you to know that you're under the protection of the blood while you're here. But don't you walk out of this building or out of this temple without giving your life to Christ. I don't care how many times you try. I don't care how many times you fail. You get out of that seat and come. I'll guarantee you Christ will receive you. And this will be the beginning of a new life in Christ. I believe this. I sense, as I said, I sense somebody getting their last call. That thing hasn't lifted from me yet. So when you feel that, come, come right, come walking down this aisle. Jesus Christ is here to receive you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, thank you, brother. Come on. We're living in dangerous times. Jesus said the thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and destroy. But he says, I'm come that you might have life, and that you might have it more abundant. I want him to do a work in your life. Tonight. I want to give you about 10 more seconds, quickly. 10 seconds by that clock. This is your night. God's going to perform the greatest miracle in your life. Going to take a stony heart out of you. Put in a heart of flesh. I don't care how many times you tried. Come on. You've been hiding this just like the brother said. He's been hiding it from everybody. The devil tried to destroy him and cut him off. God's got a work for you to do and you're going to do it. But this is where the starting point is. Oh, hallelujah. While the choir sings softly, just keep singing softly. I want every one of you in front of me to raise your right hand, if you will, please. Audience, raise your right hand. Pray with me. You in your homes, I want you to raise your hand right there where you are, in the den, in the living room. Repeat this prayer after me. Say, Father. Say it out loud. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you tonight. Come into my life. I'm sick of sin. I made up my mind. I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to make heaven my home. But Lord, I'm weak. I invite you to come into my life. Walk in me. Talk in me. Be my God. And let me be your child. Thank you, Lord. I believe with my heart. And I confess with my mouth. God raised Jesus from the dead. You said if I believe and confess that, then I am saved. Thank you, Lord. Now raise both hands and thank him for it. While I talk to my television audience. While I talk to my television audience, if you have prayed that prayer, watching me on television, I want you to write me a letter. I have a special book I'm going to send you. It'll explain to you what has happened in your life and is preparing you for this great event, the rapture that's about to take place. Everybody said amen. Amen. You may be seated if you can. Is there anybody in my audience that has been diagnosed with cancer? If you've been diagnosed with cancer, would you please come down here and stand? I believe God's going to heal you right now. Cancer is a demon spirit. God doesn't put cancer on people God takes it off of people Jesus went about doing good healing all that were sick and oppressed not of the father but of the devil if God now hear me let me give you a little theology study if God put sickness on people Jesus had no business 
taken it off of people. Because Jesus said, I must be about my Father's business. And he says, I can do nothing but what I see my Father do. And Jesus went about healing all that were sick and oppressed of the devil. And he's given us power over all the power of the devil. Now look at me, you folks that are here in this line. I'm going to curse that cancer. I'm going to talk to the cancer. I'm going to command it die and disintegrate. And I'm going to command it to pass from your body. Now, I'm not a medical doctor, but I'm a prayer. And when I get done praying for you, then I want you to go back to that same doctor that said you had it. Don't tell him you had prayer. Just tell him I want another examination. Let him be the one to tell you it ain't there. Would you like to blow that doctor's mind? Then when he asks you where you've been, tell, a, tell him I changed doctors. I go to Dr. Jesus now. Amen. Are you ready? How many of you all out there believe God heals cancer? Stand with me. You're going to help me pray. If you have cancer watching this television program, if you can get close to that television set, Come here, Bishop. Come here with me. This man of God's been, a long time ago, been preaching in a tent, just like me. I know he has. This man of God has power in his life over sickness and disease. This is Bishop Gilbert Patterson from the Temple of Deliverance Church of God in Christ right here in Memphis, Tennessee. And it's a high privilege to have him by my side as I pray and curse cancer and command it to disintegrate. God said, if two of us here on earth agree as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father in heaven. Come here, Bishop. Stand down here with me. This woman has cancer of the brain. Of the bone, I'm sorry. Into the bone. We're going to lay hands on you. In the name of Jesus. That's what God tells us to do. You shall lay hands on the sick. And they shall recover. Spirit of infirmity called cancer. We curse you at the roots. I command the cancer to die. I command it disintegrate. Penetrate right into the marrow of the bone. Why, you devil? In the name of Jesus, that's the power of God. There it is. Come on, girl, that's the power of God on you. This is what I saw her doing in the spirit. I am healed by him. Deaf. You got hearing aids? Take them out. It's one of the miracle ears. Yeah. I can't hear a thing now. I was on both but I left the other one at home. All your life? All my life, ever since I was a little kid. Can you read my lips? Yes. Now, she left the other one at home. Now, she has one. She, she can hear a little bit, but all her life she'd been deaf. And I had her take that out. Now, she, she can't hear a thing, but she can read my lips. Deafness is one of the easiest things to move. It's a deaf spirit. You, can you read my lips? When I pray, I'm going to command a deaf spirit to come out of your ear. 
and you're going to feel a pop. And you're going to hear without that hearing aid. Tonight. You ready? How many of you believe that? If you believe it, put your hand up and pray with me. You deaf spirit. I come against you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. The Lord's given me power over you, deaf spirit. I command you to take your filthy hands off the woman. All of her life, you've had her in bondage. No sound. My God, let her hear the words of the book tonight. You deaf spirit, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, I command you come out. Open. He just listened to me. Open. Now, I got my fingers stuck right up tight against her ears. And I got her eyes next to my chest so she can't see my lips. The first sound I want her to hear is all you people clapping your hands. Go ahead. You hear that? God gave us television. We got this on television. You know what television means? Television. And we're telling a vision. You're going all over the world telling everybody you were deaf. Now them ears are open. And you're letting for real. I know it's for real, baby. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now listen. Listen, folks. I've been in this too long. Don't you lift no man up. I couldn't heal a flea if it had a headache. It's Jesus who's the healer. All he called me to do was to lay hands on the sick, and he said, they'll recover. And I'm just so stupid enough to believe that. I believe all I got to do is pray one prayer, and God heals you. Amen. He's one that does the work. Do you see all them folks that got saved tonight? How many of them you think got saved? All of them. How can you say that? I didn't touch any of them. I ain't no savior either. And I ain't no healer. And I don't have to touch every one of you. All I got to do is pray. And when I pray, God hears our prayer. Bishop, you're going to agree with me? How many of you need a miracle of healing? You need a miracle of healing? I want you to put your hand right where the, where, the, where the problem is. If you can do it without embarrassment. Bishop, give me your hand. You and I are going to agree. Now, there's people that are watching this on television. Look right in that camera, Bishop, will you? We're going to agree together now. Father, in the name of Jesus, Bishop Patterson and I join our hands together in faith. For the people here in the temple, as well as the people that are watching all over the world, those that are listening by shortwave radio in every nation of the world, 
you foul spirit of infirmity, you devil of destruction. We come against you in the name that's above every name, the name of Jesus. Every knee shall bow, every tongue must confess that he is Lord. In the name of Jesus, I command you, come out of the people. I curse every sickness, every disease, and every infirmity, and I call the resurrection power of Christ alive from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. Be healed. Be delivered. Be set free. I curse drug addiction and alcohol. Come out in the name of Jesus. I come against that foul, perverted spirit. I command that unclean spirit, come out. This resurrection power comes alive to restore the people of God. And in the name of Jesus, we call it done by the faith of God. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. Now listen, if you're watching by television, tell your next door neighbor what God's done. Drop me a letter. Let me know. Testify. You that are here tonight, I want you to testify now. Tell three people. The Bible says in the mouths of two or three witnesses, every word is established. Tell three people. Say, God just gave me a miracle. I'm healed by his strike. Tell three people this. It's done right now.